let's look to God in prayer and we'll begin. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we come before you tonight and we thank you for the scriptures, the word of God, the revelation of God to man. And Lord, we do thank you for this precious book. And as we study it tonight, may the Holy Spirit himself be our teacher and instructor. Uh, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit might illuminate our hearts and minds and souls and spirits, Lord, that we may behold wonderful things from the word of God. And as we see all this, Lord, we do pray that we might glorify the Lord Jesus and lift him up in our hearts. And may he be exalted here this night. In his precious name we pray, amen. Well, if you have your uh, books, uh, right in the front of the book, there's this chart. You notice right up at the top of the chart, it says the chronological order of Daniel. Chronological means in the order in which it happened. Now the book of Daniel is not written in chronological order, but as we study it, we're gonna study it in chronological order. And I'll show you uh, what we mean by that in, in just a moment. But first of all, notice that in each one of these chapters, it's broken up through these lines that go right across here, which is the church age. These prophecies in the book of Daniel are interrupted by the church age. They're partially fulfilled, and then the church age begins. Now, when the church age begins, God's prophetic clock stops when we're living in a parenthesis in time. When the church is raptured out of here, God's prophetic clock will start to tick once again, and it will pick up everything here that is below the line. And so this is what we mean by, uh, we, we say that uh, we're living in a parenthesis in time, and uh, this down here below the line is what we call the end time. That's the name given to it in uh, in the Bible, it's also referred to as the last days, the time of the end, and so forth. And that's all happens after the rapture. So even though the, there's a beginning of fulfillment uh, before the rapture, the complete fulfillment is after the rapture. Now, you notice in the chart, it says outline of the book of Daniel the prophet, and then it says chapter one, chapter one goes right across horizontally. Then chapter two is the image, we saw that. Chapter three is the enforced worship of the image. That's the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. We saw that. Then we saw in chapter four last week, the vision of the tree, how that tree pictures the Gentile world power right up until the time of the end. And then notice the very next thing here is chapter seven, where we have all the beasts. Last week we did chapter 4. This week we're doing chapter 7. Next week we're doing chapter 8. And then if you notice after that, chapter 5. We missed chapter 5, but we pick it up way over here. Then we go from chapter 5 to chapter 9. From chapter 9 to chapter 11. Then we pick up chapter 6. They say, why are we jumping around so much? in, the, in the, uh, the book of Daniel. If you go back now to uh, where we are today, that's the fifth lesson, but it's the seventh chapter. And so if you'll take your Bibles, please, and open up the book of Daniel to the seventh chapter. Up until now, Nebuchadnezzar has been king of Babylon, all through chapters one, two, three, and four. Nebuchadnezzar is the king. But then we come to his grandson, Belshazzar. Now, Daniel 5.30 says, In that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. So we know from chapter 5 that that was the last year of King Belshazzar. King Belshazzar was king for, well, actually he was co-king, but he was king, he ruled for 10 years. So chapter 5 is at the end of his rule. Chapter 7, verse 1 says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So we know chapter 7 is before chapter 5. Chapter 8 and verse 1, it says in the third year of king Belshazzar. 
So we know that that is also before chapter 5. Belshazzar is only in three chapters here in the, uh, in the book of Daniel. And the chronological order is chapter 7, chapter 8, and then chapter 5. Because chapter 5 he gets killed. So um, this is, uh, um, this is the, the reason we say we're taking this in chronological order, not in the way in it was written. Well, on the first page we have the image. The image is of the head of gold, which represented Babylon, the arms and uh, breastplate of silver, which is the media Persian Empire, then the belly and thigh of brass, which was Greece, and then finally the legs, which were of iron, and then iron mixed with clay, which was the Roman Empire. Now you notice that the feet of the image are down there below the line. When the Roman Empire dissolved, Jesus didn't come back again. But the Roman Empire has to be in power when Jesus does come back again. And so we need to look for the, the lateness of the hour in which we're living. We need to look for the reestablishment of the Roman Empire, what we call the revived Roman Empire. Now, in the, right next to that, we have these beasts. We see the winged lion, we see the lopsided bear, we see the four-headed leopard, and then we see a beast that is diverse from all the others, the Bible says. Now, these beasts represent the very same thing as the image represented, with a notable exception. If you look down below the line, down below the line, we learn something from the seventh chapter we did not learn from the second chapter. We learn here that the Antichrist comes out of this revived Roman Empire. Daniel chapter 7 then, and we want to uh, examine this, this um, scripture. And I'm going to ask you to follow with me. I want to read the first 14 verses. Please follow in your Bibles. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. The great sea is the Mediterranean Sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. We're going to see those four beasts today. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, and I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Then he says in verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised itself up on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. Verse 6 tells us, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. And then we read in verse 7, And after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now this fourth beast is the revived Roman Empire. Notice the mention there of iron. It had great iron teeth. Remember the part of the image in chapter 2 that represented Rome. There was, it was made out of iron, okay? But we read right at the end of verse 7 that it had ten horns. Now this is the first time now that we're going to see uh, the, the uh, meaning of the horns that come out of this beast. Now in the image in chapter 2 it had ten toes and the ten toes correspond to the ten horns. But there's more here because we read in verse 8 then, I considered the horns and there came up among them another little horn. So this is an eleventh horn. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I beheld till the thrones were, ca were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head was like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. 
thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now that's the vision that Daniel has. And then the rest of the chapter is the interpretation of that, of that vision. The first thing we'd like to uh, have you made aware of is the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is mentioned three times in this chapter. It's uh, mentioned the first time in chapter uh, 7, verse 9. And if you read that, there can be little doubt it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse 9. He says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the Ancient of Days did sit. And then it gives a description of him. And look at that description. That's like you read in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Hair as white as wool and, and, and all of that. It seems clear that the Ancient of Days here in this verse is the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we also read of the Ancient of Days in verse 13. And as you read it, it can be no doubt that the Ancient of Days in verse 13 is God the Father, not God the Son. Verse 13 says, I beheld in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven. Well, that's Revelation 1, 7. He comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. Uh, the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. So uh, the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus, is, is referred to there. It's talking about his second coming and the Ancient of Days. There has to be God the Father. We also read in verse 22, the Ancient of Days, and from the description, it has to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22 says, Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Well, that sounds like the second coming and the millennium. Jesus there is referred to as the Ancient of Days. Now, how can he be referred to two times as the Ancient of Days, and the God the Father referred to one time as the Ancient of Days? Well, we know Jesus is God, and that's just one of the Old Testament evidences that Jesus, God the Father, and God the Son are one and the same. One God in three personalities, three persons. So both of them, God the Father, God the Son, are referred to as the Ancient of Days. All right, let's move along in the, in the chapter here. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar sees this great statue. This great statue represented the kingdom's world empires, There's four empires that dominate the whole world. The first one was Babylon. We have, there's no question about that because when Daniel interpreted the vision for Nebuchadnezzar, he said, thou art the head of gold. So that represented Babylon. Then he said, there'll be another kingdom following you, which will be inferior, but it also will be a world kingdom. That was the Medes and Persian Empire uh, that conquered Babylon. That takes place in Daniel chapter 5. Then we read that the belly and thighs were of brass, which represents the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. They also ruled the whole world. Alexander ruled the whole world by the time he was 32 years old sat down and cried because there were no more kingdoms to conquer, no more worlds to conquer, and died at 33. So he had a very short life, and he rose to prominence very quickly, and then passed from the scene very quickly. Well, that part of the image represented Greece. Then we come to the, the legs and feet, which represented the fourth world empire, which did not come on the scene until about 30 years before the birth of Christ. 
And the, the prophecy is that that empire was to split in two, that hence you have the two legs. And the Roman Empire did that. It split in two. You had the eastern half and the western half. Those of you that are history buffs have studied the Roman Empire. You know about how it split in two and then just gradually weakened. Well, the image was made of iron, as part of it was iron, but then it became iron mixed with clay on the feet. And when the stone, which is the second coming of Jesus, smites the image, it topples the whole thing, it hits it on the feet and brings the whole thing down. Because of that, we say that the Roman Empire has to be in power when Jesus comes back again. Now, Rome passed from existence, and so it has to come back again, it has to be revived. So we call it the revived Roman Empire. Now here in chapter 7 of Daniel, we have four beasts. And these four beasts represent basically the same thing. Babylon is depicted as a winged lion. Medo-Persia is depicted as a lopsided bear. We'll show you why he's lopsided in a moment. The Greek Empire is depicted as a four-headed, four-winged leopard. And the Roman Empire is depicted as a beast totally diverse from all the other. And out of the Roman Empire comes the Antichrist. So here are these four beasts representing basically the same thing. When Nebuchadnezzar, that heathen king, saw the world empires, to him it looked like a beautiful sculpture. When Daniel is given this vision, they don't look like a beautiful work of art to Daniel. They look like vicious, savage beasts because that's what the kingdoms of this world really are. These four kingdoms, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome, from these four kingdoms, the fourth one is Rome. Rome was in power when Jesus was born. Rome stayed in power for a lot of years, and then Rome dissolved. But according to the word of prophecy that we have read, there are ten horns that rise out of this Roman Empire. And they are going to form what we refer to as the revived Roman Empire. We have today, it's called the EU, the European Union, we have what could be, possibly could be, the beginning of the kingdom of the Antichrist. Because the European Union is a... Well, it's political, it's military, it's economic, it's social. Uniting all of Europe. People have had a dream of uniting Europe for centuries and centuries and centuries. And, and, and different people had different, uh, different thoughts on how to do it. Hitler had one idea. He said, you just conquer everybody and I'll be dictator of the whole thing, but that didn't work. And others have had usually a, a military solution to this problem, but no one has ever been even close to uniting Europe. There was an entity called the Holy Roman Empire. Don't confuse that with the Roman Empire. It had nothing to do with the Roman Empire. Robert Ripley, the author of Believe It or Not, said there was only three things wrong with the Holy Roman Empire. Number one, it wasn't holy. Number two, it wasn't Roman. And number three, it wasn't an empire. Other than that, it was fine. But it was an attempt to unify Europe. Well, today we have a another attempt to unify Europe that seems to be working. It's working slowly, but it is working. The European Union, they now have no need of passports anymore. You can go from nation to nation, uh, European nation to European nation, just like you can go from state to state here in the United States. In fact, they, it is often referred to as the United States of Europe. and. Um, now they have the common currency, the euro dollar, although there are three nations that are not using it right now, but uh, that'll come in time. And so they are being unified. Europe is being, being unified. Now out of this unification comes this little horn. Now we're going to see that little horn is the Antichrist. He's going to come on the scene. He won't be here till after the church is rapt till the church is raptured. But he's going to come on the scene, so don't look for him. If you're saved, you won't be here when, when he's revealed. I know Christians have spent so much time trying to figure out if this one or this one or this one is the Antichrist. It doesn't matter, because we're not going to be here when, when it happens. Okay, now the, the, the first kingdom, the, the winged lion. I want to show you some things about the winged lion. 
This represented Babylon. And verse 4 says, The first was like a lion that had eagle's wings. And he says, I beheld until the wings were plucked and so forth. And a man's heart was given to it. It's interesting that in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar was a man that became a beast. In chapter 7, he's a beast that becomes a man. But here it is, a winged lion. Now that apparently made an impression on Nebuchadnezzar. Because when the ruins of ancient Babylon have been, were uh, 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 dug up by archaeologists, they found something called the Ishtar Gate. And on the Ishtar Gate, they found a winged lion. Now, whether that had any uh, reference to Daniel's prophecy here, I don't know. I don't know which was first. But here is something quite interesting. Nebuchadnezzar was, t was, was told that that represented him and his kingdom. So being a humble fellow, he's not this great Babylon that I have built, he said there uh, last week we saw. Being a humble fellow, he decided to put out his own version of a winged lion. There's his head on it. He's got the lion with the wings, but instead of a lion's head, it's got Nebuchadnezzar's head and face on it. Well, uh, that was interesting that he uh, that he did that, that gives validity, historical validity, to the prophetic scriptures here. Not that we need history to confirm the scriptures. It's the other way around. The scriptures confirm history. But at any rate, um, here we see the winged lion. Then the second one, uh, the second beast, was a lopsided bear. And notice it says about the bear that he raised up on one side. Now the reason that he is lopsided and raised up on one side is because of the fact that this was two nations, Media and Persia, and they acted as one nation. However, the Medes were the stronger of the two. And so they raised up, it raised up there on the, on the one side. The three ribs in his mouth are also symbolic. The three ribs represent, first of all, the Media, secondly, Persia, and thirdly, Babylon. You say, well, why would Babylon be in there? Because Babylon was conquered by Med the Medes and the Persians. And that's true, they were, but Cyrus, the king of, ba uh, king of, of uh, the Media Persian Empire, he, for a while, moved his headquarters, his capital, into Babylon. And he ruled his domain, which was Ultimately, the whole world, he ruled from Babylon. So that's represented here by the three ribs. The leopard is, is different from all the rest, represented Alexander the Great. He died so early in life, they really were not ready for his death. And so his kingdom was just a short-lived kingdom. Greeks himself remained in, in world power, but it was divided up on, on, to his four generals. Each one was given a segment of it. Now that was all prophecy when it, was, when it was written in the book of Daniel. It's long gone ancient history now. But at that time it was prophecy. Alexander died and it was divided up to four, his four generals. That's why the leopard has four wings and four heads. Well then the, the last one that is given there is this beast, this other beast that is diverse from all the first. Now of those four world empires, two are from the east, Babylon and Medio Persia. Two are from the west, Greece and Rome. Now for many, many years, the world was pretty much dominated by the eastern powers. Europe for many centuries was nothing but a ragtag place of uh, uh, barbarians and, and and semi-civilized people. Um, they called them Huns and Vandals and, and so forth. Europe was not a great power. There was no great world powers in Europe at all. America hadn't been discovered yet. The balance of world power was in the East. And this prevailed for quite some time. Now if you go back to chapter 4, where we were last week, if you turn back to chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar is given the tree vision and the tree represents the Gentile world power. Remember, the tree is hewn down. And in verse 15, it says, Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass. 
these two bands were placed upon this tree stump. One was iron, which represents Rome in the image, part of the image that was iron. And brass, that represented the Greek empire. Those were the two European empires. Down through the centuries, the Eastern uh, world, the Eastern world has been pretty much the dominating nations. And that actually lasted until a little less than 100 years ago, if you believe that, 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 that recent. It was in 1917 that the British defeated the Turkish Ottoman Empire. And that was a great cause of rejoicing in the Western world. They feared that Ottoman Empire. The Turks were a fierce people and th th they feared them greatly. And this empire was spread out all over. And on many occasions it invaded Europe. And on many occasions it even conquered parts of Europe, Spain and, and some other countries. That's the reason that in Eastern Europe, you ever wonder how they got so many Muslim nations over there? It was from that time when the Ottoman Empire had conquered that territory. So the East prevailed and it pretty much stayed that way up until the past century, around 1917, less than 100 years ago, and the Ottoman Empire uh, fell. Now, that indicates to us that the Bible teaches that in the end time, it's not going to be the Eastern world that is going to hold the balance of power, it's going to be the Western world. And that brings us to Western Europe and the Western Hemisphere. The West is going to be uh, where the, that power shift shifts to. Now, in the end time, I want to give you something to think about here. You can, you can ponder this. We got a, a revived lion. Now, we know that we're going to have a revived Rome. We know that already. Now, we saw the four beasts here. They pass from the scene. But if you notice in this seventh chapter, it says that in verse 12, as according to the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. All four of those nations are still around, but they're not world powers. Babylon is Iraq. The Persian Empire is Iran. And Greece is a fourth-rate nation today. Their currency is so bad that they're not even allowed to use the new European euro dollars. Uh, they're just, a, just a, a small people. And of course, Rome, Italy is uh, where Rome is, and at this point, Italy is a very weak country. They also only recently, um, their economy got good enough to use the, the euro dollar. So, um, the, these, these four nations aren't much of anything. Now, if there's going to be a revived Rome in the end time, maybe all of these nations, all of these animals are going to be revived. What about a revived lion? in the latter days. And who uses a lion as an emblem? Well, that's Great Britain, the United Kingdom. And from about 1600 till about 1945, they were a great world power. In fact, it was said the sun never sets on the British Empire. They were spread so far around the earth. But by the end of World War II, they were so devastated that World War II ended in 1945. They were so devastated that and their uh, dominion had shrunk so much. Uh, they are no longer what could be regarded as a world empire. They're not even an empire anymore. They're the United Kingdom. I remember as a boy, Canada. I used to go to Canada. They had the Union Jack for a flag. They, uh, their national anthem was God Save the, Qu the Queen. Um, that all changed. Now they have the Maple Leaf flag and their national anthem is O Canada and so forth. And even though there's still a technical bond there with England, they're not, it's not what it was years ago. And, and this is what's happened to the British Empire. So they kind of passed from the scene. They're still there, but they're not a great empire anymore. What about a revived bear? Russia for a long time has been known as the bear, the big bear from the north. Well, in 1917, they had a revolution in which Russia not only defeated the Tsar, but they took 15 surrounding nations and formed what is called the USSR, the Soviet Union. And then and when World War II ended, here's this 1945 date again, when World War II ended, they just took all of Eastern Europe. 
So they already had 15 surrounding nations, Estonia, Latvia, and so forth, Lithuania, all of those nations, the Ukraine, all of them. They were already part of the Soviet Union. They took all of this and, and the Soviet Union covered one third of the globe. And they were a great empire, but they didn't last too long. And by 1993, the revived bear had passed from the scene. Well, what about a revived leopard? Maybe the United States could be a revived leopard. Now, I don't have anything to link the United States to a leopard except this. First of all, the leopard was the, is the fastest of animals. It represented Alexander the Great and his conquest of the world, and he had done it all by the time he was 32 years old. Came up very fast. Well, the United States has come up very fast as a world power. We are the most powerful nation in the world today, and it happened very quickly. We're, we're just a little over 200 years old. In fact, we became the dominant world power before we were even 200 years old. Those other nations are hundreds, and in many cases, uh, a couple thousand years old. So maybe we could be, uh, uh, that leopard, end time leopard, a revived leopard could uh, speak of the United States. So there's a couple other reasons that I don't have time to go into right now, and I'm not saying that it is, but we really became the dominant world power in 1945. You have that date all, th all through here. That's when Europe was left in shambles and we pretty much became the, the world power. Well, after the uh, revived leopard, which is going to have to pass from the scene like all of the others to be regulated to a lesser role, comes the revived Roman Empire, and it very well could be what is termed the European Union. Whether it is or not remains to be seen, but it very well could be. Now, out of that revived Roman Empire is going to come the Antichrist. And he is seen here, pretty, isn't he? This is where he's seen as a, a beast. Now here we have his horns up here. He's got 10 horns, and we find another horn coming up out of here. And in Daniel 7, verse 7, he sees this fourth beast in the night vision. He's uh, dreadful, terrible, strong exceedingly. He has great iron teeth, and there's a mention of iron again. And remember, iron represented the Roman Empire and he devours, breaks in pieces, stamps the residue with his feet, and it says and he was diverse from all the beasts that were before him, and it had 10 horns. Now we're gonna see those 10 horns representing 10 kings. We'll see that later on in the book of Revelation. Now in the, if you look with me please, in verse 17, these great beasts which are four are four kings that shall arise out of the earth. He never says that those four beasts are those same four kingdoms that the image represented. We know they were in the book, in the book of Daniel, uh, but he never says that about them in their revived form or their, or their latter day form. So then, I'd like to have us look at that horn. It tells us there in this um, eighth verse that there's these 10 horns come up out of this beast. And then it says there was a little horn before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now, if you turn over in your booklets a couple of pages over, you can see a picture of a horn that has the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, let me just uh, tell you what I mean by that. The Hebrew word here for horn is the Hebrew word karen, which is pronounced just like a girl's name, and it's translated three different ways. It can be translated a horn, or it can be translated a peak, like the peak of a mountain, or it can be translated like a corner or a cornerstone. Those are all correct ways in which this can be translated. Now, I'm not saying it's translated wrong, I don't believe that. It's a horn and it comes out of, the be out of the beast, and I believe God has preserved his word perfectly, and I'm not suggesting anything different. But it is, wants you to be aware of the fact that one of the ways, one of the uh, meanings of this word is a peak. It's a peak, like the peak of a mountain. And there we find in it an eye. In Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 17, 
It says, woe to the idle shepherd. The idle shepherd is one of the names in the Bible of the Antichrist. He's referred to as the idle shepherd. The idle shepherd that leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now what does that mean? Well, there's obviously some symbolic language here. And notice that the Antichrist only has a left eye. And notice that he only has a left arm. His right arm is dried up his, and his uh, uh, right eye is also. What he sees, he sees with his left eye. And what he does, he does with his left hand. Did you know that in that picture of that all-seeing eye that we just showed you, the same picture it's on the back of the dollar bill and so forth, did you know that that eye comes out of the occult? It has some deep occultic meaning to it. But that eye is always, always a left eye. It's a human eye. Now what did we read here in Daniel? It says, out of this horn, there were eyes like the eyes of a man. It's a left eye. Why? Because it's a, this is a picture, this, this uh, all-seeing eye is a picture of the Antichrist. A left eye. That's what Zechariah 11 says. It's, it, it's referring to his, only his left eye. Back in the 19th century, in France, the Parliament of France, all of the socialists began to sit over on the left-hand side of the, of the auditorium. And so all of the more conservatives, they sat over on the right-hand side. Now from that, a term, a definition has arisen, which is left wing as opposed to right wing. And socialists began to be called leftists. According to Zechariah chapter 11, the Antichrist is a leftist. Now you say, how do you know he's a leftist? I want to show you some things about the Antichrist and how it would fit into socialism and left wing politics today. First of all, total equality. Here is a biggie for the socialists. Total equality. Unfortunately, total equality can only be achieved at the very lowest level. You cannot have total equality up here. It's impossible. And so, you wonder why there is a dumbing down in America of our school children? Because they want equality. And you can only have it down here. And this is not only true in our school system, it's true in a lot of other things. It's, a, it's a, um, uh, uh, an attempt to achieve equality. Well, um, <laughs> equality sounds very noble, but let's look at it. Satan said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. What did he want? Equality. He wanted to be equal with God. This is where this idea was born, right in the wicked heart of Lucifer. So when he sinned and he was cast down, he comes to the, when God created man, he comes into the Garden of Eden and he meets with Eve. And what lie does he tell Eve? It's the same identical lie that he told himself. He said to Eve, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened. And look what is going to happen after your eyes are opened. Ye shall be as gods. Equality. You're going to have total equality. And she did, but it was at the lowest of levels. They, what we call the fall. The human race fell. So we have total equality. Secondly, a leftist noble proposition is the elimination of hunger and poverty. That's a noble goal. Who could be against that? Well, the scripture tells us a few things about that. In John chapter 13, we, we read something about Judas here. It says Satan entered into him. I just wanted you to be aware of that. Satan entered into Judas. Remember, it was Satan that said, I will be like the Most High. It was Satan that told Eve, you'll be like God. Here, Satan enters into Judas. So what does Judas do? We read in, in the 12th chapter then, it says, Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, he says, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor. And he had the bag and bare what was put therein. 
a phony concern for the poor. We could have taken this and given it to the poor. He didn't give a rip about the poor. Not only that, but you know I believe that churches are guilty, inadvertently guilty many times, of doing a disservice to God by their uh, overly concern for humanity. Now, please don't take this wrong, but the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if any man will not work, let him not eat. Now, it doesn't say if he cannot work, that's a different matter. It says if he will not work, let him not eat. So what do we do? <laughs> we have missions and food kitchens and so forth to feed those that will not work. You know, and that's at cross purposes with God. Uh, somebody was telling me just the other day when um, the state of Michigan cut off the welfare, all those guys that were getting welfare, not, not all of them, but many of them that were getting welfare, they went running over to the uh, Social Security office and claiming disability. And most of them, of course, were turned down. And guess what they had to do? It's unthinkable. They had to go to work. And they're working. And, and they're supporting themselves. The Bible says, if any will not work, let him not, let him not eat. Well, Jesus said, the poor always you have with you. And that's why you're going to ha always have the poor with you. And there are those that will not work. And the elimination of poverty and elimination of hunger is a goal that sounds very noble. And it's one that Satan uses. That Judas didn't care about the poor. He just cared for the money he could get on the way as, he, as it was funneled through to the poor. All right, we got total equality, elimination of hunger and poverty. How about this one? There's a biggie. Redistribution of the wealth. Daniel 11:24 says about the Antichrist, he's going to come up peacefully and he's going to do what his fathers have not done. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, and the riches. That's the redistribution of the wealth. That's socialism. He's going to redistribute the wealth. He's going to take from the haves and give to the have-nots. He's going to take from the productive and give to the non-productive. Pure, unadulterated socialism. And that is a, um, another product of, uh, of the left. We got another picture of a beast here. This is a little different. Now in the book of Revelation it says that this beast has seven heads. And this also represents the revived Roman Empire. It says there are seven heads, five are fallen, one is and the other is not yet come. The Roman Empire had passed through five forms of government, kings, councils, dictators, decemvirs, and military tribunes. They'd already passed through those five forms of government. Then it says one is, and that was imperial Rome. Rome was in its sixth or imperial form. And then it passed from the scene. And then, the, but the scripture goes on and says that one is not yet come. Now these seven heads represent the seven forms of government. It says the other is not yet come. I believe that seventh form is a socialistic government. The European Union is coming together, forming a socialistic union of European countries. Well, let's get back to this. We have total equality. We have elimination of hunger and poverty. We have redistribution of the wealth. How about a homosexual agenda. Isn't that something that the left is interested in and promoting? They call it tolerance. And they tolerate everything except Bible truth and Christians. Anything else is tolerated. All in the name of tolerance. Well, do you ever wonder why all of a sudden homosexuals are coming out of the closet do you ever wonder why all of a sudden it's being purported as a legitimate alternate lifestyle? Have you ever wonder why uh, school children in many places are actually encouraged to consider homosexuality as a legitimate lifestyle? Why there's all of this propaganda all of a sudden? I'd like to suggest a reason to you. I believe that it, the world is getting ready to accept the Antichrist. And to accept the Antichrist, they may very well have to accept a homosexual. Because Daniel 11.37 says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Now, I'm not sure that that means that he's going to be a homosexual, but it looks like it could be that he will have no desire for women at all. 
And if the Antichrist is a homosexual, the world is going to have to accept him. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to have to make homosexuality look attractive and legitimate uh, for it to be, uh, for it to be uh, accepted. We've got total equality, elimination of hunger and poverty, redistribution of the wealth, homosexual agenda, and fifthly, a promise of peace and security. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, Yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Peace and safety. That word safety is literally safety in the sense of security. Secure. We hear so much about security nowadays. Well, you put all these together and you got a program of the left. <laughs> you probably got the Democratic Party's <laughs> platform of the 2000 elections. <laughs> I don't know if you're doing that. But, but at any rate, uh, we, we, find, we find all this. Um, the Antichrist is going to be connected with all this because Satan is connected with all of this. Now, notice that this, about this little horn here. I shouldn't have turned the page. This little horn, right at the end of verse 8, it says that he hath a mouth speaking great things. If you look down in verse 11, it says... I beheld, and because the voice of the great words which the horn spake. This guy has got a mouth on him. He's an orator. We read in uh, verse 20 of this chapter, right near the end of the verse, a mouth that spake very great things. And verse 25, he shall speak great words against the Most High. At the end of, of 11.21, it says he shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries. So he's going to have a mouth that he is able to use. He obtains the kingdom by flattery. We read in Revelation chapter 13 that there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Great things and blasphemies. He does both. He opened his mouth to blaspheme against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. So the, a great mouth is given to the Antichrist. Now in that picture of the all-seeing eye that we're all so familiar with, you have something right down at the bottom there, right underneath this all-seeing eye, it says Novus Adoro Seclorum. That's Latin. In case you didn't know it, Latin is the official language of the old Roman Empire. And I don't think it'll be the language of the revived Roman Empire, but we have a phrase in Latin. And what does it mean? Novus adorus seclorum. It literally means the new world order. And so it's pointing towards that fact of the new world order headed up by the Antichrist. Now the Antichrist is, a, is um, going to come out of Europe. The Western powers, the Western kingdoms are going to be in power, okay? which very well could be and probably is the European Union. And he is going to form a allegiance with the nation of Israel when he comes on the scene. Apparently there's going to be a treaty already there and he's going to confirm that treaty. He's going to confirm it for seven years. That seven years is the length of the tribulation period. Now, the Eastern world is going to come against Israel. Nations from the Middle East are going to come against it. We saw that last week. And that is what you turn on one of the news channels today and you see that very, very thing just threatening there, hovering over the nation of Israel. Well, the Antichrist is going to make a covenant to protect them. And when these Eastern nations come against him, he's going to very easily, quite easily, defeat them. He's going to drive them back. And so any threat of, a war of opposition to the Antichrist is then eliminated, and that takes place right at the halfway point of the tribulation, which was three and a half years, and from that point on, the Antichrist can become a total world ruler. And as a total world ruler, and we'll see this play out in the book of Daniel in the future weeks, as a total world ruler, he doesn't need Israel anymore. He's got this covenant to protect them. When they invade Israel, he zaps them. And he, he puts them on the run. 
And so uh, he destroys the world, these world powers. Uh, Russia's going to be one of them. It looks like the uh, huge army from the east, the kings of the east. We, we talked a little bit about that last week. And so he doesn't need to be nice to the Jews anymore because he no longer has any opposition and he turns all of his fury and all of his wrath upon the Jews. And that's going to take place the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Look with me, if you will, at verse 25. It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall give unto, into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years. Time means one year. Times, plural, means two years, and half a time means half a year. So three and one half years. So he's going to turn all of his wrath and fury, satanic fury, upon the nation of Israel for three and a half years. Now we have reference a number of times to that same time slot. If you turn to chapter 12 with me, chapter 12 of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, verse 6, we read, And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, that man there is an angel, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? You want to know how much longer is it going to be? Here's the answer, verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swore by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. Three and one half years. Now this last three and a half years, it's referred to three different ways in Bible prophecy. It's called a time, times, and half a time. It is also referred to as 42 months, and it is also referred to as 1260 days. Now, anytime you read one of those three expressions, it's always talking about the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. On your note sheet, notice there, Revelation 11:2. it says, But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot. Look what it says, forty and two months. Forty-two months is three and a half years. All right, then in Revelation 11, 3 says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy twelve hundred and threescore days, or twelve hundred and sixty days. Twelve hundred and sixty days is also three and one half years, the Jewish calendar it's based on the moon instead of the sun, and so it, it uh, has 12 30-day months. So 1,200 uh, and uh, 1,260 days is three and a half years. Then we read in Revelation 13, 5, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Here we have 42 months again. Same identical time period. Revelation 12, 6, talks about the woman fleeing into the wilderness, and there she's protected of God, it says, a thousand two hundred and three score days, or twelve hundred and sixty days. After that comes Revelation 12, 14, mentions a time and times and half a time. So this is the final form of Gentile world power, the kingdom of the Antichrist. It comes out of Western Europe, rises to prominence, then is disintegrates and is to arrive on the scene revived in the last days and it has to be there at the second coming of christ remember the stone smites the image and uh, the image comes toppling down here in chapter 7 verse 14 says there was given unto him that's the son of man verse 13 there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people nations languages should serve him and his dominion, an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. And in, that, in the same chapter, uh, verse 27 says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, that's the Jews, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So we're going to stop here because our time is, is already gone. Next week we're going to pick up chapter 8. We're going to see two more beasts in chapter 8 and the part they have both in ancient history and in the end time prophecy. Shall we pray together? Loving Father, we come now and thank you for the precious word of God. Lord, may the Holy Spirit just give us 
insight into the Word of God to see wonderful things that you've hidden there. And Lord, we know you've said that eye hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things that uh, he hath prepared for those that love him. And Lord, what wonderful things you have tucked away in the Word of God for those that love, uh, that love you. And Lord, we do pray that we, you would just create a hunger and an appetite in each one of your people to get into the Word of God as never before, to search the scriptures and see that these things are so, because we believe Jesus is coming soon. Blessed now as we're dismissed, in Jesus' name, amen.